Okay. And you can enable your live transcript if you like. I'm going to do that. Uh, the auto transcription, you should be able to do that. Uh, good afternoon and good morning uh, based on where you're at. My name is Tanya Gross, and I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Open Education Network. And I'm the one who's been sending you all of those emails. So it's nice to see some of your faces. Um, welcome to everyone. Thank you, Cheryl Collier from the University of Arizona and Lily Todoranova from Rutgers uh, University who are two of our outstanding uh, instructors for the certificate in OER librarianship. Uh, Cheryl is one of the original instructors who actually designed this program along with some other um, people. And Lily joined us, I think this is her second year. Um, so I'm very pleased to be working with them and, and I'm thankful that they are willing to lead a session on working with campus partners today. So with that, uh, I will hand it over to Cheryl and Lily. Thank you so much. And uh, we really appreciate all of you joining us synchronously. Uh, so I am going to actually turn off my video to preserve bandwidth and share my screen with the presentation. Let's see, present, start presentation. Okay, are you seeing, oh, not the right slide. Are you seeing the uh, slides? No? Yes. yes, we are, Cheryl. Oh, good, good, excellent. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about ways that you can partner with a variety of campus stakeholders. And the list that we're going to share isn't exhaustive. So please think creatively about other potential campus partners at your institution. In this first part, Lily and I are going to share how campus partnerships work at our institutions, and then we'd like to hear from you. Uh, the second half will be your chance to ask questions and share examples and exchange resources. We'll be uh, sharing a lot of links in the chat, um, but we'll be compiling and sharing the Zoom chat comments afterwards. Um, we'll try to preserve the names of the person who made the comment so that you can follow up with that person using the certificate uh, directory afterward. So we hope this session gives you some, some new ideas. The first campus partner I want to focus on is the bookstore. And we've been fortunate at the University of Arizona to have a campus-owned store. But I knew that, do know that people have been able to collaborate successfully with Barnes and Noble and Follett stores. So I encourage you to set up a meeting with your bookstores if you haven't done that and explore ways that you can work together. For us, there had been a history before my time of mistrust between our units. And we found that it really built some great bridges to do a joint pilot I was just telling Tanya about this um, before we got started. We tested an e-textbook platform um, and the pilot itself was a disaster, but the good thing that came out of it was that we knew OER had potential and uh, we really bonded over <laughs> all of the problems that we had with this technology that's since been sold to Unison, the company's out of business. Um, so it, it solidified our relationship not only with the bookstore, but also with IT and our teaching and learning unit, and, and they became the founding partners of our OER action committee. So I highly recommend trying to pilot to build those bridges. Uh, the other thing we do with our bookstore is exchange a lot of data and referrals. So on the bookstore's textbook adoption form, there's a box to check if the course doesn't require materials. And the bookstore shares all of the textbook adoption information with us each semester. So I can go through and check with those folks to see what they're using. Um, sometimes they think they're using OER, uh, but it ends up to be a library licensed ebook or sometimes a pirated textbook. So those are good educational opportunities. Um, if, if they are using OER, um, then I can add that to our total statistics. Um, we invite each other to sales pitches that we get from vendors. And so that way we know what they're being pitched and they know what we're being pitched. 
Um, we also do joint presentations to campus as well as trainings. And that's been a really useful way to present a united front in terms of all of the different course material options that are available to faculty. When our campus was in the middle of uh, budget cuts and furloughs last year, one of the cost cutting ideas that circulated was outsourcing the bookstore. So the bookstore leaders and I collaborated on a presentation to faculty senate explaining why this wouldn't save money and how it would hurt campus as well as faculty and students. And it looks like the idea has successfully been squelched. Um, also, when a new campus was forming, uh, our College of Veterinary Medicine, they were really dedicated to keeping course material costs as low as possible. So a liaison librarian and I worked closely with the bookstore and newly hired faculty um, to, to select course materials. And as a result, we were able to provide free access to 38 of the 41 required textbooks. Uh, that's the closest we've been able to come to a, a Z degree. The Z stands for zero textbook costs. The library is also integrated into the bookstore student book list. So for each required textbook, there's a check for UA library or check UA library for ebook link that students can click and it'll either say, yay, the library has just the ebook you're looking for or sorry, that's not available. We also link to each other's websites. Um, I send each semester an email to all faculty on campus a few weeks before the bookstore's textbook adoption deadlines, letting them know that the deadlines are coming up. And uh, so this, this ends up in increasing the number of textbook adoptions that are reported, um, which helps us, it helps students, and it helps the bookstore. We also present uh, joint savings estimates, and this has required some alignment in how we calculate those savings. Um, but we we report library ebook savings and OER. They report inclusive access. And uh, when I can get access to the chat, I'll share a link to a really great infographic that Iowa State does to report their combined savings. Our bookstore director recently sent that to me. I believe Abby Elder did that, uh, but it's a really great way of presenting the impact of your program. And we also invite each other to conferences. So I've attended the textbook affordability conference with the bookstore multiple times. And our assistant bookstore director joined me at the 2017 Open Ed Conference to do a roundtable on bookstore partnerships, which was fabulous. This check for ebook availability form is something new I launched last year as a way to be more proactive with faculty than, than reactive. By the time they submit their textbook adoptions to the bookstore, it's really too late for them to switch to free or low cost materials. Um, so I include this link in the email I send to faculty each, each semester. Um, it lets them tell us what, which book they would like to use. If it's not available with an unlimited user license through the library, which it usually isn't, then we can go through other alternatives with them, like OER, other ebooks, um, chapters or uh, journal articles through fair use, streaming video. Um, and if we rule out all of these free to use options, then we can refer faculty to the bookstore to explore inclusive access and explain the pros and cons of automatic billing. Uh, so th those are just a few of the ways you can partner with your bookstore and build those direct lines of communication. The next category is instructional support. And so this would include instructional designers, any units that work with online courses, your teaching and learning centers, Partnering with them is a great way to raise awareness of OER and increase adoptions. When courses are being created or revamped, that's a great time to encourage faculty to make the switch to OER or library content. Uh, our library and digital learning unit partner on our Pressbooks EDU site, which we launched last summer. Um, 
in 2019, I'd encourage personnel from Digital Learning, which designs our online courses, to attend the Open Ed Conference in Phoenix. And their associate provost um, learned about Pressbooks there and got all excited about doing open pedagogy in her classes that she teaches. So she offered to split the cost of the Pressbooks license with the library, which was awesome. I, I highly recommend partnering with campus units that have bigger budgets than you do um, or more financial resources. Uh, we also collaborate with our teaching and learning center and other campus partners on webinars and workshops. Um, last year at the start of the COVID pandemic, when instructors were trying to just madly sh shift to online courses, uh, we set up a small group to partner on communications and have a central place where faculty could look for help and webinars. And I think that helped cut down on just the deluge of emails that everybody was dealing with. We've also connected with the existing faculty learning communities on campus. I partnered with a nutritional sciences professor to lead an OER learning community. And last summer when we were doing our soft launch of Pressbooks, I co-led a learning community with an instructional technologist. Um, I've set up a, a Google Drive folder with our Pressbooks learning community resources. Um, which I'll share in the chat when I can get access to it. Um, these include uh, PowerPoint slides, emails that we send out, all kinds of links. And so if you're interested in setting up a learning community, um, this might give you a, a foundation to start from. I know in previous OEN videos, uh, like Karen Pakula from uh, Minnesota State has done some really great sessions on their learning circles. Um, they actually pay um, stipends for participation. Um, so that's an interesting model to look at. Um, but uh, one of the great results of our learning community with Pressbooks was getting to meet an iSchool professor who was interested in open pedagogy. And so for the past two semesters, I've been working with her big gen ed classes on uh, an open textbook called Humans or Social Media. And uh, just a couple days ago, she actually released the most recent version of it. So I'll, I'll share that in the chat as well. It includes student videos and essays, and they, they just did a fabulous job. Um, lastly, I think it really helps to refer and consult together and also link to each other's resources um, in LibGuides and websites. Um, that's been an effective collaboration um, method for us. So now I will pass it to Lily. Thank you, Cheryl. So in addition to all of that, um, this is a broad kind of category uh, of collaboration that we weren't really sure what to call it. <laughs> but basically what it comes down to is these large systems, uh, technological systems at universities um, that could have an intersecting interest within OER. The first main one would be the registrar and the course marking system. Um, and by the way, there is a link uh, that you won't be able to click on with our slides, but we'll put that in the chat uh, because it's a really wonderful open uh, book on exactly how you would uh, pursue a, mar a marking system at your institution, um, among other things. So in the case of the registrar, you should you know, also be aware that uh, systems are complicated at universities. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. Um, there's a lot of uh, sort of overlap and a bit of bureaucracy asso associated with all of these. Um, so something I discovered in my institution at Rutgers is that in fact, we don't just have one uh, registrar system, we have three of them. We have a actual registration system, we have a course lookup system, and then we have this third one, which I believe just generates like a weekly calendar. Um, but students use all of them, um, which is interesting. Right. So you have to, you know, once you identify the types of systems that exist, um, you have to figure out which one you would want to integrate a course marking uh, with. Right. So you might not be able to 
do it to all three systems, unfortunately, because often they don't necessarily work well together or as well as, as we want them to. So you probably want to target the one that uh, advisors use, the one that um, students use the most, and the one that might be the most visible place for you to indicate an open uh, or an affordable course. And that brings me to a second point, which is, you know, you want to figure out, are you going to be somehow marking every course that is uh, that is OER and affordable? And how would you know, you know, what's going on with those courses? Um, if you are interested in markings that indicate not just open educational resources, but affordability, uh, then you're in the in the phase where you want to decide uh, what what is low cost at my institution. Um, there's various different measures uh, that you can read about actually in that text, I believe, uh, that we'll link to. Um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those tricky things that you just have to make a decision and just go with it. And then another thing to think about is, um, do you want to be doing this automatically? So every course that you've identified as open and affordable automatically gets this course marking, or would you like your faculty to be able to opt in and out of that designation for whatever reason? But the idea is in general, you know, not to get stuck in the, the mire of it as much as to help your students achieve transparency about these things. Because in many cases, um, it is, basically impossible for them to know as they're registering for a course if there is any open and affordable element. Um, another, um, oh, and one last note about that is that a very helpful perspective can be offered by your student government on that topic because they obviously have a vested interest in, um, in transparency in that particular case and their stories are impactful. And so I would just suggest that working with the student government on that particular issue. Another one that's on the slide is the Office of Assessment. I'm sure that, um, by the way, that everybody has a different name for that. Uh, but it's basically the office that uh, administers that student end of semester survey that all students are supposed to take. Um, it's a uh, you know, it, it's, it could be an easier or harder lift to get in, involved with that particular office, depending on the culture of your institution. But if you were successful, you know, consider uh, how much data you might be able to gather by putting in a question uh, about textbook affordability within that survey. Um, it might be really nice to have. You can move, yeah. Oh, okay. So in this one, I, you know, in my particular role at Rutgers, I, I'm an, also an undergraduate experience librarian. And so this is where that comes out a bit, um, which is that I interface with a lot of student groups and uh, student groups are an essential and often overlooked uh, outreach element to your open and affordable plan. Um, in particular, you know, I, I really enjoy working with student activists. Uh, so you might have various groups on your campus that are active and want to uh, enhance the student experience for whatever reason. Um, affordability most often falls into that. And so the, the PERG groups are active across uh, the country, but there might be others uh, at your institution that you might consider approaching and meeting with. Um, I like working with these groups because they are really good at what they do. They are great organizers. They're very sociable and open and approach faculty and they're loud, which I think is actually a good thing. I think students should be loud and should be um, in control, more in control of what is happening with their education. Um, and uh, they also can provide you with uh, really important and impactful student stories about why affordability matters. Uh, it's one of those arguments that you cannot make enough times for it to, to really sink. Um, and they also might have a little bit of funding. So in our particular, in my particular situation, student government has kind of a pretty good budget. Um, 
And they have in the past donated some funds to our incentive, uh, OER incentive grant program for faculty. So you never know what might come out of, of a collaboration within student government. And of course, as any relationship uh, with a campus unit, this is gonna come up again and again, you do have to invest time and resources, uh, you know, your own resources in it because it, it's kind of one of those things that starts every year over again because um, students are gonna roll over and new students are gonna come on board within these le leadership roles. And so it's one of those cyclical things that we engage in, what, but it is important to maintain a connection. Thanks, Lily. I'll just add that in working with our student government leaders, uh, we were able to get an OER resolution. Um, they had invited me to talk to them about textbook affordability issues and OER, and I challenged them to, to do a resolution, and they took that ball and ran with it. Um, I connected them with the student PERGs. Um, there are some other student advocacy resources that we can share, um, but yeah, that was, that was great to see. Um, student driven OER awards are another idea that I've seen used on some campuses. Um, you know, these awards are something that faculty can put in their CVs. Um, so, so that's something else to consider as a partnership. Let's see if I can. There we go. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, faculty governance and um, one of the ways that I've been able to build my campus network is by getting involved in faculty senates and groups that work on student success issues. So this has given me some useful access to administrators and influential faculty that I wouldn't ordinarily have. Um, you know, we're a big campus, close to 47,000 students, and I, I'm not a manager, so I don't normally interact with the president and provost, but I can through faculty senate. Um, so I had mentioned the presentation we did uh, with the bookstore, um, you know, being able to get that on the faculty's a Senate agenda was a perk of, of being involved. Uh, another benefit was when our student affairs policy committee was asked to revise the campus textbook policy in the student handbook or the faculty handbook. The policy was outdated and it didn't mention digital course materials at all. And it also left loopholes that harmed students. So after months of heated debate and lots of rewrites, um, the policy went into effect in 2018. And I'd hope to encourage the use of OER and other free to use resources in the policy, um, but that section ended up becoming best practices. So we'll have to try again, <laughs> take another crack at that another day. Uh, our library dean is currently leading an open, as, open access task force that's hoping to update the promotion and tenure guidelines to specifically give faculty credit for work in open access and OER. I know the University of British Columbia has been able to do this with OER. Um, Spark did a, a nice article about this, um, so I'll, I'll share that link with you later. Um, in the meantime, until we can get this specifically spelled out in PNT guidelines, I advise faculty in their dossiers to make the case for the impact um, that their OER efforts have on students and the university. You know, they can talk about worldwide reach. They can talk about the number of downloads for OER they've created, um, the impact of open pedagogy projects and how it expands um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, student success metrics. There are lots of ways that faculty can demonstrate impact um, without having OER specifically in the uh, PNT guidelines. I find that uh, the Disability Resource Center can sometimes be an overlooked uh, partner in OER task forces or affordability initiatives too, but they're super important. Um, when the COVID pandemic hit last spring and we were in the midst of spring break when the university told students not to come back, that classes were moving online, a bunch of them emailed and said, wait, our, 
our textbooks are are there. Um, did I just lose access? Oh gosh, my nope, screen. You're still here. Cool. Um, the participants just disappeared off my screen, and so I wanted to make sure I <laughs> hadn't suddenly lost Zoom. Okay, excellent. Um, so anyway, we we partnered with the Disability Resource Center, which had already arranged for digital files of textbooks for students who had disability accommodations. And in some cases, we were able to make fair use arguments for sharing access with um, certain other students, like the ones who had bought the textbooks, they just couldn't get to them because they were left behind in their dorm rooms. Um, we also partner with our, our Disability Resource Center to test platforms and tools and resources. Uh, they used to have a blind employee who would test our platforms with his screen reader. And we actually connected him with some of our major library vendors um, to let them know about accessibility problems and to correct them. We also do joint accessibility trainings and we exchange information, for example, on lawsuits related to course material accessibility. There was a courseware lawsuit recently um, and best practices. And we do referrals to each other and link to each other's web resources. I'm sorry if you're hearing a leaf blower there right outside the house doing yard work at the moment, which is fun. The joy of live webinars. Okay, so this final slide before we get into our discussion um, is just uh, throwing a couple of other suggestions out because there are many uh, initiatives at, at universities targeting this issue of affordability, which is pervasive. Um, I think most universities are pretty aware of it at this point. Um, so for example, in my institution, we have a very strong leadership cohort for first generation students. And we've been able to do some cross messaging there about uh, this the open and affordable program that I'm in charge of. Um, there's also student veterans. I've recently had some discussions with them uh, about their specific needs. And um, part of it, part of this kind of thing is just to meet more people on campus. Frankly, you know, there might not be an over obvious overlap with your programming and their programming, but there's always cross messaging that can be done. And there's always points where um, if the issue is equity and affordability, you might find some, uh, some, way, some way to intersect. And also another thing to point out is that a lot of these specific populations of students, many of them have um, advisors, um, designated advisors. And I cannot overstate the importance of working with um, advisors if you're trying to promote open and affordable content in your institution. So I think that this is uh, all we have uh, to share with you. Um, and the rest of the time, which we're perfectly on time, is just to uh, brainstorm a bit with you about all of these different things. And so as Cheryl mentioned, we are going to be keeping an eye on the chat as well as compiling the responses so that we can share them out. Um, but let's start with just a few questions for you. Okay, so the first one is, is all encompassing. So what are some examples of successful collaborations with your campus? Uh, oh, with your campus store. It's about a campus store. So we'll give you a few minutes to um, think about it. But if anybody out there already has some ideas, I think I saw one early on in the chat about at least a potential interest with partnering in the books with the bookstore, please feel free to just unmute yourself and share with us. I'll just share too that um, I've been following uh, the UC Davis store and their textbook models. Um, they have a new one called Equitable Access. Uh, and 
our bookstore and I actually had a meeting with them about how they collaborate the bookstore and the library um, because they leverage OER and library ebooks to lower the costs of the, the program for students. Uh, and for each uh, student who's in a class that adopts OER, they, the bookstore donates $10 to uh, an OER program um, that the library runs to promote increased ado adoptions of OER. So I thought that was interesting. Um, we also are looking at some of their workflows uh, and how they exchange textbook adoption lists. That's great. Yeah, I feel like there's uh, there's many possibilities and it does depend on, I guess, administratively. Well, I feel like it does uh, where the bookstore is positioned within the campus. But it's nice when you could find that overlap between what you're doing and the bookstore. And I do see many things in the chat. Um, so I'm just going to point some of them out. Uh, Jasmine uh, writes that uh, in the pandemic, they worked together with a bookstore to, to ship things from the main campus to, to the other campuses and collaborate on ebooks with the bookstore, which is great. And that does um, bring to mind a thought about just in general, it might be a good idea for all of us to reach out to our campus bookstore and ask them what the impact of the pandemic has been, like what has, how has their business model changed because of the closures and remote work? I think that would be an interesting thing to explore. Um, let's see, uh, Jamie has others. Uh, so our campus bookstore now sends us files each term so we know what textbooks will be required and their costs. We do some analysis and try to order the most expensive ones, uh, not OER, but a good partnership. I totally agree. Just this um, aspect of awareness and again, transparency back to the student is essential. Um, I will say that in, <clears throat> sorry, in our institution, we have had trouble um, even getting those lists because uh, it does require them, I guess, faculty to send a list of their course materials in advance to the bookstore. And that often does not happen here, <laughs> not in the timeline that you would want. So that's something to, to consider. And maybe when Cheryl was talking about University Senate, uh, that's a conversation that to have with faculty um, in some kind of a venue like that. Yeah, in the past, we've asked our provost to send an email to all instructors, letting them know about the textbook deadlines from the bookstore. Um, I, and then I've started sending the, each semester emails to instructors to remind them. So um, we, we find that new instructors just don't get much onboarding about the entire textbook process and how it works at the university. So um, in a lot of emails, when I'm communicating with faculty, I'll just remind them about the process. Um, and it was interesting to hear the UC Davis store talk about how they collaborate on sharing that textbook list with the library. Um, we get a monthly, or, or sorry, a weekly update in an Excel spreadsheet that they said they use Teams to do more frequent sharing of uh, just a single Excel spreadsheet so they can work on it simultaneously. So they'll send uh, updates to the list several times a week. And then the librarian who looks for the ebooks um, is able to turn that around within about 24 hours. So that seems like a much more efficient workflow than what we've currently been using. So we're hoping to tweak ours and improvement and improve it. All right, so I'm seeing lots of um, really great ideas and conversation in the chat. Well, again, just as a reminder, we'll save all of that so that you can go back and refer to it. And just, you know, it's nice that in this live webinar, we could all meet each other and hopefully follow up with each other after. Lily, do you want to move on to the next question? Yeah, let's do it. Would you like to do this one, Cheryl, or? Sure. So how have you partnered with instructional designers and your teaching and learning center? Um, if you're doing a learning community or learning circle, what is it covered and how is it structured? 
Um, we'll give you a few minutes to type in the chat. I'll just share that our learning uh, community tried to cover a lot of OER and related topics, things like fair use and copyrights and accessibility. Um, we covered where to find OER, um, resources for adapting and creating OER. Uh, it's such a wide ranging area and uh, it, it's something that faculty, again, don't get a lot of training in. So there's a lot of ground you can cover in these um, learning communities. I'm looking now. I will just the... mention one um, area within Rutgers that I discovered is that our instructional designers um, actually consult with new faculty that are hired. Um, so I think within the first semester that they're hired, just to have a conversation in an advisory role about um, pedagogy, I guess. It's one of only a few conversations faculty really gets to have about pedagogy. It, so it's it's a really important um, one to uh, intercept, if you will. And uh, we've started having conversations about how possibly the role of um, the course materials can be can be incorporated into that conversation. I see Kathy wrote that she presents as part of their new faculty series. That would be so great to have access to that. Uh, yeah, attending each other's events, pitching each other's stuff. I, I think anything you can do to do those cross promotions is such a great approach. Oh, Kyle says the teaching center is co-located in the library with the digital scholarship uh, unit, online education and academic technologies. Oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Anastasia says uh, regarding instructional designer partnerships, they generally come uh, to the library to consult about logistics and management and have actually built textbook alternatives. Wow, that's great. Emma notes that they have an instructional designer on their strategic, strategic plan committee for OER. Monthly meetings, yeah, regular communications are a great idea. Collaborating on events like Open Education Week. That's fantastic. Eric notes, having difficulty working with the Teaching and Learning Center on campus. The director is very resistant against OER and is actively discouraged offering any sorts of workshops or training for faculty on the subject um, and asks for help or suggestions. Uh, you, Aaron, that's, that's a really common situation to, to have like one person who's a roadblock or you'll spend a lot of time building up a great campus partnership and then that person will leave and it feels like you have to start at ground zero to rebuild that relationship. Um, my advice is, you know, work with the people who are willing to work with you and um, sometimes I just have to wait out <laughs> the people who are roadblocks, uh, wait them out. Uh, but I, I'd be curious if other people have suggestions uh, for dealing with, with people who are roadblocks. I just want to say I absolutely agree. Um, early on when I started uh, working with OER, I met with a, also a very re resistant at the time head of the um, instructional design unit and had a challenging conversation with, with him. Um, but it was interesting because there were others in the room that were below him, I guess, in the hierarchy of that particular unit that had, had reached out afterwards and asked me questions and we maintained a relationship. So often it is really just one person. And uh, I would, again, uh, I would second what Cheryl was saying that you, you, know, you have to move past that person somehow and just work with the people around that person who are aware of their personality and you know are willing to to innovate and do different things. I like Kathy's suggestion in the chat. She says she follows them on Twitter and interacts with them. Uh, try to make friends. It's it's not. Uh, it's worth a try. Yeah. 
um, like I said, our, our pilot uh, project on the e-reading platform helped uh, heal a bad relationship between the library and bookstore. Um, Kathy also suggested just trying to find out why they're resistant. Uh, you know, is it based on misconceptions about OER? I think uh, faculty and administrators hear so many misconceptions about OER from vendors and, and salespeople who have a vested interest in, you know, ooh, OER is low quality or it's really hard to use or, you know, because they're trying to sell their own products. Um, so sometimes it's a, an educational process of, of correcting those mis misconceptions. looking through the chat for for other comments. Oh, Lily says they got CARES Act funding uh, to hire temporary faculty member in the Teaching and Learning Center specifically to work on OER. Um, I've seen a number of discussions recently about using CARE CARES Act funding uh, to promote OER. Amy Hoffer at Open Oregon just had a huge success. Um, she had grants that hadn't been funded through the US Department of Education and, and other programs. Um, so when her state government said, hey, do you have any use for some CARES Act funding? She was able to pull out a ready to go grant and say, yes, you know, this is what we would do if you gave us a bunch of money, which is just absolutely fantastic. So um, I believe she may have even blogged about it recently. I'll try to find that link and include it in the, the list of resources at the end. Okay, Lily, do you want to move on to the next question? Sure. All right, so this one is about course markings, um, which is a very active area for, for many of us. Um, so if you are doing anything with course marking, what challenges have you run into? What barriers exist to implementing that process? So take a moment, um, finish your thought on instructional design and we look forward to seeing what you all are doing. Cheryl, are, have you uh, done much with course marking? We have not. <laughs> um, it, it's not mandated in our state. Uh, when we recently had two student regents uh, on the Board of Regents who happened to be from the University of Arizona, we met with them and tried to get them excited about pitching the idea of course marking at the, the state level. Um, and they were interested but um, they, they really are right now prioritizing other basic needs like food insecurity and housing insecurity. So I think we planted the seed for the idea, but uh, you know, um, they, were, they were more interested in building their basic needs task force to, to work on some of these other issues first. Yeah. Um, I am noting a few things in the chat here. Let me... Uh, see if I can find them. Um, so Sarah says that course marking is required in our state. So again, uh, uh, as, as Cheryl was alluding to, recently there's been a bunch of legislation, not very evenly across the country, but in some places that actually mandates course marking, unfortunately not in, not in New Jersey. Um, she says that a big challenge was getting people to recognize the difference between OER, zero cost and inclusive access. It is a challenge of, of definitely educating uh, your university about the differences between those. I see them confused more often than not. Um, and it's a bit, you know, it's a, it's a role for the library to play, I think, in, in educating. And then Randy writes that um, the all the dean's assistants enter courses differently. Uh, working on adding textbook cost is actually helping to standardize the process. Yeah, I think, from what I gather, um, the whole course signup process at universities really needs an overhaul in general. It, you know, the systems that are being used are quite 
clunky and not particularly good. Uh, so this could be an opportunity if you see a way to sort of insert um, the affordability and OER element, but also just, you know, it's just good for in general to update these systems. And then Margaret writes that we have course markings, but not the software to filter, which is very time consuming. Uh, yeah, I'm in a sim similar situation where right now we, there is no way to sort of do, do um, just do it all at once. You kind of have to rely on individual departments doing the most of the legwork, which I agree is not ideal. Um, and I just have to, you know, every time I get frustrated with that, have to remind myself that it is useful. It is something that students, you know, can can use, act, you know, actively use in terms of how they structure their schedule. So hopefully all of the, the nitty gritty work is, is worth it. And Cheryl, if you see any that catch your eye, just let me know. I'm trying to, to read through everything, but I'm way behind. Yeah, sorry. The <laughs> the the HOA is moving around the development right now, so they just pass through the backyard uh, with their leaf blowers. So, uh, yeah, they. Um, I, I see the comment about you know the the challenge in determining what's low cost, what's no cost, uh, you know, and. Uh, with our bookstore, when we've introduced the idea, they said, well, the pricing is dynamic. Um, you know, we, we change based on market conditions. So at what point do you pick a price? And do you pick the new print price? Do you pick the rental price? Do you pick the used price? Um, so there are a lot of complexities to, to doing course marking. But I think that resource um, that uh, Michelle and uh, and others put together is so great. Um, Emma also points to a really important uh, barrier, um, which is that, you know, even if you can uh, advocate for course markings with your registrar and you figure out the system and all of that stuff, some faculty might not want their course to be listed as open and affordable because they might feel that their colleagues would consider that kind of a competition, you know, that students would sign up for their section versus some somebody else section. Um, and it could introduce uh, issues within, within faculty um, and within departments. I definitely acknowledge that. I think it's one of those issues where um, it has to be a faculty conversation. It, you have to get your faculty together to sort of understand the importance of it, the importance of the concept for students. Um, you may have some legislature to back you up. Um, you know, it, there is, I believe, still uh, some kind of a vague clause that says that students have to know the cost of the course material. I think it's a it's a federal. I, I I'll, I'm getting this wrong probably, but I, if I find it, I will I will find it for you. Um, but just in general, the concept makes sense, right? You need to know as a student how much things are going to cost in the courses that you're signing up for. So I wonder if it requires a difficult and maybe um, over time conversation with the faculty, but one that is worth having. That's a good point, Lily. And I think it's tied into kind of the whole cultural uh, discussion that's happening right now with cancel culture. Um, you know, in that faculty have the academic freedom to choose any course materials they want, but there may be consequences for choosing high priced course materials instead of OER. So yeah, I think Lily's suggestion to kind of talk, talk through with faculty and and let them know the impact of high course material prices. Um, you know, sometimes our faculty are, are surprised that, that students are having to make tough decisions about food or rent or course materials. You know, they, they see the, the iPhones and the expensive cars on, on campus and the long lines at Starbucks. And, and some of our faculty assume that students are doing great. Um, so um, one of the more impactful bits of information I've shared with faculty in OER presentations is about the food insecurity and housing insecurity.
right, so let's move on, I think, to the next qu uh, question. I know that we have about 10 minutes left. All right, so if you're working on promotion and uh, tenure guidelines, where or how did you start? I know this was an active discussion in my cohort. That says, haven't started yet, but hoping to talk with the new senior associate dean about the possibility. Christine says, uh, a workshop or series to teach faculty how to make teaching effectiveness, um, how to demonstrate that impact in a dossier would be helpful. Yeah, I agree. It, it's, uh, it's really all about the impact and you know, I think you can look at aspects of your university strategic plan and, and talk about innovation and access and whatever your strategic plan highlights and tie OER into that to, to demonstrate how creating or using OER makes a difference for students. Alexandra says, uh, brought up OER at a PNT meeting, got some pushback from faculty. Alexandra, can you say a little bit more about the pushback that you got? And it, as Alexandra is typing, um, it, it occurs to me that a lot of these things, I mean, I think we've already identified so many difficult conversations with faculty. Um, it seems to me that, you know, just because we're getting pushback doesn't mean necessarily that it's not an idea that's resonating with people. Um, I just want to throw that out there because I, I find that, you know, as somebody who also is part of University Senate, um, there are certain faculty members who do the pushback, right, <laughs> on basically most ideas. Um, and they don't necessarily have to be the ones that are as influential as others. And so I just want to throw that out there to say that pushback might not be a bad thing. It just, it starts a conversation that, you know, uh, can be challenging, but overall it, it moves the needle forward. And I love Ashley's comment about uh, taking a different approach, um, a, addressing it at the smaller levels with departments. Uh, we had this happen with Z degrees. We tried pitching it to, campus administration when the strategic plan was being revamped and the, it was just crickets. And so um, they didn't want to <laughs> include it in the strategic plan. <laughs> we thought, why? that's crazy. You're missing a great opportunity. But instead we went to the colleges and departments and pitched the idea to them. So uh, yeah, if you run into a roadblock <laughs> at one level, try a different level. I think that's a great approach. As she says, you know, just try to move the needle somewhere. Yeah. Oh, Emma brings up a guideline document based on Doers 3. Oh, Emma, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I'll include that link in the resources. Um, that came up in a conference um, just this week. Um, the, the Doers 3, um, yeah, produced as far as guidance. Ooh, oh, thank you, Emma. I just scrolled down. Thank you for putting the, um, the document link in the chat. Alexander mentions concerns related to um, varying quality of OER or the perceptions of varying quality of OER. Um, yeah, that that's a whole different conversation um, that we often have to have with faculty. Let's see, I think there's one more um, 
question that we wanted to pose um, about partnering with disability services and student success centers. In the meantime, Anastasia says, um, still trying to figure out where PNT files uh, go to be reviewed and who stewards the criteria. Uh, you know, sometimes this is done at such a high level um, that um, we, we may not realistically be able to have a lot of impact in this area. Um, so that's when just working directly with faculty or working directly with departments may be our best approach. I'll throw another thought out there, which is um, the union. Um, I don't know if you know a lot of places don't have a union, uh, but our union is very much a promoter of, of open ed and affordability. Um, so we haven't been able to like put anything concretely on paper, um, but it starts with conversations and it starts with um, just getting, trying to figure out, I guess, who is on your side at your institution. and. Um, just gonna say that, you know, it's it, it's more popular of an idea that you might think, um, at least that's my sense from, from talking to people. It's just that those who really, really don't like it are, are very, very loud about it. As you're typing, I'll forward to our, our last slide that has the contact information for me and Lily. Um, feel free to follow up with us. Um, I see people in the chat saying they have to run off to another meeting. Um, I guess, well, like we said, we'll compile these chat comments um, and make sure the links to resources that we've mentioned are available. And I'll email that um, by next week. Um, Thank you so much for attending and sharing your experiences and challenges and successes and your great ideas. Um, and resources. Yes, thank you, everyone. We'll stick around if uh, anyone wants to chat more. Um, I know I, I have a few minutes, but I really appreciate everybody's creative and open ideas. And I hope that you connect with each other after the session today and continue talking. Thank you, Cheryl and Lily. Thank you. And if you have ideas for partners that we didn't get to, um, feel free to mention those in the chat as well. I think advisors are one group that I haven't reached out to, but probably should. Um, cultural centers might be another option. Manisha asks, is someone working in a tribal college on a reserve? I don't think anybody in my cohort um, that I can think of. Manisha, I wonder if you could post also to the uh, Canvas discussion uh, board, the one that goes to everybody. OK. Uh Excellent presentation uh, today. It's um, you know, a pleasure to listen to all of you. It gives me so many different ideas. Thank you so much. Good, I'm so glad. Thank you. Cheryl and Lily, do you think I'm safe to stop recording now? Yes, I think so. Okay. And I just saved the chat. If if someone else